This is an introduction to Karl Marx and the Close of His System by Eugen von Bumbawerk and Bumbawerk's Criticism of Marx by Rudolf Hilferding. There's also an appendix consisting of an article by Ladislaus von Berkowitz or Berkowitz on the transformation of values into prices of production in the Marxian system. Edited with an introduction by Paul Sweezy. And so the introductions by Paul Sweezy. All right, let's get started. This volume brings together two of the most important items in the large literature concerned with criticizing and evaluating the economic doctrines of Karl Marx. Bumbawerk's contribution in its English translation has been out of print and very difficult to obtain for many years. Hilferding's answer to Bumbawerk was brought out in translation by an obscure socialist publisher in Glasgow and never acquired wide circulation. I think it's Glasgow. Sorry, Glasgow. And never acquired wide circulation in either Britain or this country. In view of the recent growth of interest in Marxism, I believe the time, time has come to make these works available to a larger English reading public, and I also believe that each gains in value through being presented side by side with the other. As an appendix, there is included an article by the German statistician economist Berkowitz. This article, bearing on one of the central points at issue between Bumbawerk and Hilferding, has achieved considerable fame, but hitherto it has not been translated into English, and I have seen no evidence that it has been read by more than a handful of specialists. I believe that serious students of Marxian economics, whether hostile or friendly, will be glad to have it made readily available for study and reference. In this introduction, I shall discuss these three works in the hope of illuminating the point of view from which their authors wrote and of placing them in the development of the literature of which they form a part. Bumbawerk's Criticism of Marx Bumbawerk's work was first published in 1896 under the title Sum Abschluss des Marxian Systems. in a volume of essays in honor of Karl Knies. It appeared in Russian the following year and in English in both London and New York in 1898. The original English title is retained here because it is by this title that the work is now widely known. At the same time, it is necessary to point out that this title is not strictly accurate and has given rise to misunderstandings. Karl Marx and the close of his system sounds like an obituary for Marx and his theories, but, though the spirit of an obituary is not lacking from Bumbawerk's writing, it would be mistaken to assume that this is what he intended to convey by the title. The third and final volume of Capital was published by Engels in 1894, and Bumbawerk's work was in the nature of an extended review. The German title means simply, On the Conclusion of the Marxian System, and this describes the work as accurately as a brief title can. It was quite natural, one might almost say inevitable, that Bumbawerk should write this book. In his well-known History of Theories of Capital and Interest, he had devoted a whole chapter to criticism of the theories of value and surplus value expounded in the first volume of Capital. There he had noted that Marx was aware that commodities do not in fact sell at their values under developed capitalist conditions. He also noted that Marx promised to solve this problem in a later volume, a promise which Bumbawerk was convinced Marx could not keep. Hence, when the third volume finally appeared with Marx's detailed treatment of this question, Bumbawerk doubtless Bumbawerk doubtless felt duty-bound to examine it with all possible care and to pronounce his verdict. In Karl Marx and the Close of His System, Bumbawerk took over the main arguments of his chapter on Marx from the first edition of Capital and Interest, and in subsequent editions of the latter, 
he incorporated the substance of the criticism of the third volume of Capital from Karl Marx and the close of his system. Nevertheless, the latter is far more detailed and elaborate. Not only does it stand on its own feet, but it contains all that is important to Bumbavark's writings on Marxian economics. If we were to understand the significance of Karl Marx and the close of his system, it is necessary to identify Bumbavark and to recognize his place in the development of modern economic theory. The relevant facts of his career can be briefly told. Eugen von Bumbavark was born 1851 into one of the aristocratic bureaucratic families which were the real rulers of imperial Austria, his father being at the time a high official in Moravia. When he was still very young, his father died and the family moved to Vienna, where, except for nine years of teaching at the University of Innsbruck, 1880 to 1889, he spent most of the rest of his life. After taking a course of law at the University of Vienna, he entered the finance ministry in 1872. In 1875, he took a three-year leave of absence to study economics with some of the outstanding German professors of the day. From this time on, his career was a mixture of government service and university teaching. He served as finance minister in three different cabinets, 1895, 1897 to 1898, 1900 to 1904. From 1904 until his death in 1914, Bumbavark held a chair in political economy at the University of Vienna. As an economist, Bumbavark was from the, the first a champion of the new subjective value or marginal utility theory, which is somewhat older contemporary. Karl Menger had been the first to enunciate in Austria. Bumbavark, along with Menger and Friedrich Weiser, or Weiser, yeah, Friedrich Weiser, whose sister he married in 1880, was one of the founders of the so-called Austrian school. His two major works, Capital and Interest, and The Positive Theory of Capital, were published in 1884 and 1889, respectively, before he was 40 years old, and as the subjective value theory spread geographically and gained in popularity, Bumbavark's fame grew by leaps and bounds. Out of his own country, he came to be much better known than Menger or Weiser. And by the turn of the century, it is probable that his international reputation was greater than that of any other living economist, with the possible exception of Alfred Marshall. Only in Britain, where, where the authority of Marshall and Edgeworth, at Cambridge and Oxford respectively, was virtually unchallenged, did Bimbavark fail to attract a substantial following? While in countries as widely separated as Sweden, the United States, and Japan, his influence upon academic economics was profound. It is against this background that we must evaluate Bimbavark's critique of the theories of Marx. Organized socialism in Europe experienced a rapid growth in the last three decades of the 19th century, and it was also during this period that within the continental socialist movement, Marxism won out over rival schools and doctrines. Hence, while the original reaction of the academic world had been to ignore Marx, it became increasingly difficult to maintain this attitude. As time went on, it became more and more urgent to organize a counterattack. The publication of the third volume of Capital offered the perfect opportunity, and Bumbavark was a, quote, natural, end quote, to take the lead. He had already, in Capital and Interest, established himself as a formidable opponent of Marxism by his attacks on what he called the, quote, exploitation theory, end quote, of interest. His international reputation ensured that whatever he wrote would, be, would receive a wide and respectful hearing. It is therefore not surprising that when Karl Marx and the Close of His System was published in 1896, it was an immediate success and soon became what might almost be called the official answer of the economics profession to Marx and the Marxian school. It would, be, it would not be fruitful to trace in detail the influence of Bumbavark's critique on orthodox economics, especially since a large part of that influence was never formally acknowledged and hence would be practically impossible to document. Franz X. Weiss, 
and et the editor of Bumbavirk's collected papers undoubtedly expressed the view of most continental, acad ac uh, continental academic economists when he wrote that Karl Marx, in the close of his system, quote, is rightly regarded as the best criticism of the Marxian theories of value and surplus value, end quote. And so far as the United States is concerned, all the serious criticisms of Marxian economics with which I am acquainted recognize the authority, if not the primacy, of Bumbavirk in this field. While the similarity of the anti-Marxian arguments in the average textbook to those of Bumbavirk is too striking to easily to be easily accounted as a coincidence. From the Marxian camp, the testimony to Bumbavirk's preeminence as an opponent is at least as striking. Louis B. Boudin, or Boudin, in the economic chapters of his important survey of the Marxian system and its critics, pays most attention to Bumbavirk's arguments. Quote, First, because Bumbavirk is so far superior to his comrades in arms and his authority is acknowledged by them to such an extent that it can hardly be claimed to be unfair to these critics to pick Bumbavirk as an example of them all. Second, because there seems to be quite a good deal of unanimity among these critics on this particular point. Value theory and the arguments advanced by the others are either directly borrowed from Bumbavirk, Bumbavirk very often with an acknowledgement of receipt, or are variations on the same tune deserving no particular attention." End quote. The situation did not change greatly in this respect in the following decades. William Blake, writing in 1939, could say, quote, Bumbavirk anticipated nearly all the attacks on Marxism from the viewpoint of those who hold political economy to center on a subjective theory of value. On the whole, little has been added to his case by other critics. Their important contributions are outside the theories he chose to contest. End quote. It has been necessary to stress the historical importance of Bumbavirk's criticism of, of Marx, but this should not lead us into the error of falsely evaluating the work itself. The truth is that in its essentials, Karl Marx and the close of his system is not a particularly remarkable performance. It is obviously the work of a skilled debater, but its intellectual content is largely confined to applications of the elementary principles of marginal utility theory. Bumbavirk's lines of reasoning was thoroughly familiar. Bumbavirk's line of reasoning was thoroughly familiar in academic economic circles, and any number of his contemporaries could have produced a critique of Marx which would have differed from Bumbavirk's only in matters of emphasis and detail. Examples of Wicksteed in England and Pareto in the Latin countries prove this, if indeed proof is required. We do not need to assume, therefore, that things would, would have been much different if Karl Marx and the close of his system had never been written. Some other economists would have came forward to do the job which Bumbavirk did, or perhaps Pareto's critique, since it bore the authoritative, the, the authoritative stamp of the Lusane school might have assumed the preeminent position that Bumbavirk's actually that Bumbavirk's actually occupied. Marx had to be refuted in history in casting her eyes over the possible candidates, selected Bumbavirk as best fitted for the assignment, but if he had refused or fallen down on the job, someone else would have been ready to take his place. Here is a case I think where we can clearly accept Engel's dictum, quote that such and such a man and precisely that man arises at that particular time in that given country is of course pure accident. But cut him out and there will be a demand for a substitute, and this substitute will be found, good or bad, but in the long run he will be found. End quote. Engels. It is not my purpose in this introduction to discuss the details of Bumbavirk's case against Marx. The reader can follow these through for himself, but I think it is necessary to say something about the attitude which Bumbavirk adopts towards Marx and the scope of the criticism which follows from this attitude. Bumbavirk was writing at a time when subjective value theory had scored its greatest triumphs and was the accepted basis of serious academic economics. Bumbavirk, in common with its other exponents, was completely convinced that economics had at last attained to the coveted status of a genuine science, and he took it for granted as requiring no argument. 
that the problems which he and his colleagues, both in Austria and abroad, were working on were the problems which the young science must attempt to solve. In keeping with this attitude, Bumbavark ex implicitly, and no doubt unconsciously, assumed that Marx had been engaged in the same enterprise and could legitimately be judged by the same standards as might be applied, for example, to Marshall or J.B. Clark. What were these problems which economics was trying to solve? They all centered around and were really dependent upon the problem of value in the sense of exchange ratios established upon the market. Quote, price, end quote, as the money expression of value was regarded as the proper subject of monetary as opposed to, quote, pure, end quote, theory. Indeed, all the phenomenon of economics, such as wages, rent, interest, and profits, were in the last analysis special cases of the problem of value, derived from and regulated by the operations of commodity markets in a more or less complex fashion. Given this starting point, the subjective value theorist has hardly any choice when he undertakes to evaluate a systematic body of economic doctrine such as that of Marx. He must first test the value theory. Does it explain the phenomenon of exchange ratios as they are found in typical concrete market situations? If so, he can proceed to the rest of the theory. If not, then the rest of the theory must necessarily be wrong and there is no sense in wasting time on it. It is like a problem in arithmetic. If you find an error in the first line, you know that the answer must be wrong and that the subsequent calculations are worthless. It was entirely within the framework of this approach that Bumbavar carried out his examination of Marxian theory. After a brief introduction, he devotes two chapters to setting out Marx's theories of value, surplus value, average rate of profit, and price of production, quote, for the sake of connection, end quote, as he says. On the basis of this exposition, he concludes that Marx had not one but two theories of value, a theory of value in volume one of capital and another theory of value in volume three of capital. In Bumbavark's sense of the term, that is, market exchange ratios. Moreover, according to Bumbavark, these two theories led to different results, not occasionally or exceptionally, but regularly and as a matter of principle. Hence, Bumbavark cannot help, quote, cannot help himself, end quote. He is forced to the conclusion that there is a contradiction between Volume 1 and Volume 3 of Capital. He next proceeds to analyze at length more than a third of the whole critique is devoted to this, the arguments by which, according to Bumbavark, Marx seeks to prove that the contradiction is only apparent and that the theory of Volume 1 is valid after all. Having disposed of these arguments one by one, Bumbavark is at last ready to deal with the heart of the matter. Quote, the error in the Marxian system, end quote, for it is by now clear that error there must be. Naturally, he finds that the error lies in the fact that Marx started from the old-fashioned and exploded labor theory of value instead of pushing his way through to the new and scientifically correct subjective theory of value. This error ramifies throughout the system and vitiates it from top to bottom. This, then, is the form and substance of Bumbavark's case against Marx. It is particularly important to recognize that it is not a personal attack on Marx, nor is it simply one theorist dissection of the work of another, though this is undoubtedly what Bumbavark was aiming at. It is rather a systematic exposition of why subjective value theory, the quote, new economics, end quote, of half a century ago, rejected the Marxian system root and branch. It is this fact, rather than any special brilliance or originality in the work itself, which constitutes the importance of Bumbavark's critique. Hilferding's reply to Bumbavark. Das Finanzkapital by Rudolf Hilferding is certainly one of the best-known works in the field of Marxian economics since Capital itself. The author is less well-known than the book, however, and it may be interesting as well as useful for our present purpose to review Hilferding's career before taking up his reply to Bumbavark, which was one of the earliest, if not actually the first, of his published writings. 
Hilferding was born in Vienna in 1877 to a well-to-do Jewish mercantile family. Hilferding studied medicine at the University of Vienna, but even during his student days, his interests seemed to have run more to the social sciences. He soon became a socialist and organized, along with Otto Bauer, later leader of the Austrian Socialists and others, the first student socialist society. Intellectually brilliant and personally attractive, Hilferding was not slow to gain the favorable attention of the leaders of the German-speaking socialist movement. In 1902, Kautsky invited him to become a regular contributor to Die Neue Site, the theoretical organ of the German Social Democratic Party. In 1906, he was asked by Babel to go to Berlin to serve as an instructor in the party school there. He remained in this position about a year and then was chosen to be the foreign editor of Farvarts or Farwärts. I think it's for Farwärts. I'm going to say that's how you pronounce that. You know the thing. But I'm trying to master my German pronunciation. Um, anyway, Farwärts. Chief German Social Democratic Newspaper. From this period on, he was prominent in the affairs of the German party, serving on its central committee and playing a leading part in its Reichstag delegation. Meanwhile, in 1904, Hilferding and Max Adler had published in Vienna the first volume in a series entitled Marx Studien, which was to provide an outlet for the younger Viennese socialist intellectuals. This first volume contained three studies. The second and third belonged to Joseph Karner, or Josef Karner, and Max Adler. The first was Hilferding's Bumbawerk's Marx Critique, which is reproduced in this volume in the English of the well-known translators Eden and Cedar Paul. Hilferding's next and most substantial work, Das Finance Kapital, was likewise published as one of the Marx Studien series, it appeared in 1910, but as Hilferding tells us in a pre preface, dated Christmas 1909, it was finished in its main outlines, quote, already four years ago, end quote. That is to say, as early as 1905. Hailed by Otto Bauer as the, quote, book for which we have long been waiting, end quote, Das Finance Kapital won for its author the reputation of being the leading economist of the German-speaking socialist movement, nor was recognition of the importance of Hilferding's book confined to Germany and Austria. Lenin was much influenced by Das Finance Kapital, and on the first page of imperialism, he refers to it in the following terms, quote, in spite of the author's mistake regarding the theory of money, and in spite of a certain inclination to reconcile Marxism and opportunism, this work affords a very valuable theoretical analysis of the, quote, latest phase of capitalist development, end quote, as the subtitle of Hilferding's book reads, end quote, Lenin. Entirely thought out and largely written before he had reached the age of 30, Das Finance Kapital was Hilferding's last important contribution to socialist literature. He never wrote another book, and what he did produce during the last three decades of his life was mainly of a journalistic nature, possessing little lasting interest. When he undertook a more general theoretical analysis, as in his contribution to a two-volume symposium on capitalism in 1931, he simply repeated with hardly any change the ideas of Das Finance Kapital. And when, oh, when war broke out in 1914, Hilferding's strong pacifist and humanitarian leanings caused him to vote with the left wing of the German Social Democratic Party against war credits. The following year, however, he was drafted into the Austrian army and spent most of the rest of the war years as a doctor on the Italian front a fact which precluded his playing an active political role between 1914 and the revolution of 1918. When he returned to Germany after the war, he cast his lot with the Independent Social Democratic Party, which had been formed in April 1917 as a result of the split between the left and the center socialists on the one hand and right socialists on the other. Hilferding quickly rose to a position of leadership among the independents, filling the important post of editor-in-chief of their newspaper, Freiheit. 
He was never a real leftist, however, and when the issue of joining the Communist International came up before the Halle Congress of the Independence in 1920, Hilferding was one of the leaders of the minority which opposed the move. The Independence now split, the majority forming the bulk of the German Communist Party and the minority seeking to rejoin the Social Democratic Party. In 1922, after negotiations in which Hilferding took a prominent part, what remained of the independent party returned to the parent organization. During the last ten years of the Weimar Republic, Hilferding found his spiritual home in the right wing of the Social Democratic Party. He was generally considered the party's leading thinker, edited its theoretical journal, Die Gesellschaft, and twice held the post of finance minister in the Reich government, once under Stresemann, in 1923, and again under Mueller in 1928-29. to Looked at from any point of view, his record, like that of the Social Democratic Party itself, was one of unbroken failure. As finance minister, he was equally ineffective in dealing with the inflation in 1923 and with impending depression in 1929. But far more important than these specific failures was his general misjudgment of the post-war situation and his gross underestimation of the Nazi danger. As late as January 1933, Hilferding wrote in Die Gesellschaft that the primary aim of the socialists was to fight the communists. Hilferding's attitude in these tragic days is dramatically illustrated by the following account, written by an acquaintance who was in contact with him at the time. Quote, I remember distinctly having spoken to him a few days after Hitler was appointed chancellor and asking him whether he thought that the time was right for the unions to call a general strike. Even then, in the first days of February 1933, he was sitting in a comfortable easy chair with warm felt slippers on his feet and remarked with a benign smile that I was a young firebrand and that political skill consists of waiting for the right moment. After all, he said, Hindenburg is still the president. The government is a coalition government, and while Hitler's come and go, the ADGB, the German Trade Union Federation, is an organization that should not risk its entire existence for a fleeting political purpose. It was only a few days later that he was hiding at some friend's house being already sought by the Gestapo. End quote. Franz Neumann has justly, rem has justly remarked that Quote, it was the tragedy of the Social Democratic Party and the trade unions to have had as leaders men with high intellectual qualities, but completely devoid of any feeling for the condition of the masses and without any insight into the great social transformations of the post-war period, end quote. To none of the leaders does this apply with greater force than to Hilferding himself. Hilferding escaped from the Gestapo in 1933, but unfortunately not for good. Hilferding went via Denmark to Switzerland, where he stayed until 1938 and then to Paris. When the Nazis took Paris, he fled south, and early in 1941 had completed arrangements to come to the United States. But just as he was about to pass to board a boat at Marseille, or Marseille, I don't know how you pronounce that. Is it Marseillaise or Marseille? Because I feel like I've heard people call it Marseillaise. But it seems like it should be pronounced like Versailles. I'll say Marseille. Anyway, by just as he was about to board a boat at Marseille, he was picked up by the Vichy police and handed over to the Germans. The end came a few days later. One report says that he committed suicide in a prison cell, another that he was tortured to death by the Gestapo. Looking at Hilferding's career as a whole, we can see that its creative phase was relatively short, being bounded by Bumbavrk's criticism of Marx at one end and Das Finance Kapital at the other. He was a person with the greatest of natural gifts, whose vision was clouded and whose energies were stultified by easy success. But the ultimate tragedy of Hilferding's life, and surely the failure to fulfill great promise, is always an individual as well as a social tragedy must not be allowed to obscure the outstanding merit of the work which he did accomplish. His answer to Bumbavrk and his study of finance capital will always remain among the classics of Marxian literature. The significance of Bumbavrk's criticism of Marx is twofold. On the one hand, it was the only full-scale reply to Bumbavrk, 
from the Marxian camp, and on the other, it is probably the clearest statement we have of the fundamental difference in outlook between Marxian economics and modern orthodox economics. I should not deal here with Hilferding's refutations of Bumbavrik's specific arguments beyond pointing out that he gives a good account of himself and shows that even at the age of 25 he could stand up and trade punches with so experienced and inveterate a polemicist as Bumbavrik. It would hardly be unfair, I think, to describe capital and interest as one sustained polemic against all early or theorists of capital and interest and also against all of Bumbavrik's contemporaries who did not agree with him. But I do want to call attention to what seems to me the most important contribution of Hilferding's work, its recognition and explicit statement of what divides the Marxist from the marginal utility theorist. And I want to emphasize that Hilferding, by making his whole analysis turn around this difference in outlook, was in fact illustrating the difference in a concrete way. Hilferding's work is divided into three parts, quote, value as an economic category, value as an average profit, and the subjective outlook. While the first two parts are necessary to a full understanding of the third, it is in this last that he states the essentials of his case with greatest force and clarity. The crucial question in Hilferding's view is whether the individual or society is made the starting point of economics. If we start from the individual, as Bumbavrk does, we are led naturally to consider the individual's wants in relation to the objects which satisfy them, instead of the, quote, social relationships of human beings one with another, end quote. Quote, such an outlook, end quote, according to Hilferding, quote, is unhistorical and unsocial. Its categories are natural and eternal categories, end quote. Marx, on the other hand, starts from society and is therefore led to consider labor as, quote, the constitutive element in human society as the element whose development determines in the final analysis the development of society, end quote. Thus it is, quote, because labor is the bond uniting an atomized society, and not because labor is the matter most technically relevant, that labor is the principle of value and that the law of value is endowed with reality, end quote. Closely related to these different starting points is the fact that, quote, in striking contrast to Bumbavrk, Marx looks on the theory of value not as the means of ascertaining prices, but as the means of, for discovering the laws of motion of capitalist society, end quote. Hence for Marx, again, in striking contrast with Bumbavrk, the assumption that commodities exchange at their values, quote, merely constitutes the theoretical starting point for a subsequent analysis, end quote. Hilferding's argument is excellently summed up in the following passage, quote, Whereas for Bumbavrk, labor seems merely one of the determinants in personal estimates of value. Excuse me. Hilferding's argument is excellently summed up in the following passage, quote, Whereas for Bumbavrk, labor seems merely one of the determinants in personal estimates of value. In Marx's view, the degree of productivity of labor and the method of organization of labor determine the character of social life. Since labor viewed in its social function as the total labor of society of which each individual labor forms merely an aliquot part, is made the principle of value, economic phenomenon are subordinated to objective laws independent of the individual will and controlled by social relationships, relationships of production, wherein commodities play the part of intermediaries, the social relationships being reproduced by these intermediate processes or undergoing a gradual transformation until they demand a new type of intermediation." End quote. Hilferding. It is characteristic of the marginal utility school that, quote, Bumbavrk has never become aware of this contrast of outlooks, end quote. The closest he comes to such an awareness is in his discussion of the, quote, objective, end quote, end quote, subjective, end quote, methods in economics, but in reality, according to Hilferding, quote, we are not concerned at all with two different methods, but with contrasted and mutually exclusive outlooks upon the whole of social life, end quote. In my opinion, this fundamental difference in outlook certainly does exist, and the fact that Bumbavrk does not, while Hilferding does recognize its existence, is itself a consequence of the difference. From Bumbavrk's unhistorical and unsocial standpoint, there is only one possible way of regarding economic phenomenon. Hence, as I point out above, he takes it for granted that Marx must be trying to do the same things that he, Bumbavrk, is trying to do. On the other hand, 
From Hilferding's historical and social standpoint, it is quite natural that the defenders of capitalism should look at the system, which they consider to be the only possible system, differently from its critics who proceed on the assumption that all social systems have a transitory character. This situation, it must be admitted, makes it extraordinarily difficult for the two schools of economics to communicate intelligently with one another. One holds firmly to the view that their respective theories must be judged by the same standards, while the other is equally insistent they cannot be. Thus, Bumbavrik regards Marxian theory as simply wrong, while Hilferding regards Bumbavrikian theory as irrelevant to the crucial developmental tendencies of the capitalist system. I doubt whether this difficulty can be overcome, but it can at least be recognized, and those who recognize it should be better able to clarify their own position to themselves and to others. It is certainly not the least merit of Hilferding's work that it not only expounds the Marxian view, but also states the difference between the Marxian and the orthodox views with unexemplified lucidity. Bortkiewicz on the transformation problem. Both Bumbav Bumbavark and Hilferding devote much attention to the relation between the first and third volumes of Capital. Bumbavark argues that the theory of value in the first volume is in flat contradiction to the theory of, quote, price of production, end quote, in the third, while Hilferding holds that price of production is merely a modification of value and hence that the two theories are logically related and in no sense contradictory, the nature of their views and of the disagreement between them was such that neither Bumbavark nor Hilferding was moved to examine critically the actual procedure which Marx used in transforming values into prices of production. Bumbavark believed that the mere fact of a difference between value and price of production was enough to derive the whole operation, deprive the whole operation of any interest, while Hilferding was concerned to answer Bumbavark's argument and not to defend Marx's procedure, and yet there is a very real problem here. According to the theory of volume one, commodities exchange in proportion to the quantity of labor stored up and living embodied in them. Surplus value or profit, however, is a function of the quantity of living labor alone. Hence, of two commodities of equal value, one with relatively more living labor will contain more surplus value than one with relatively more stored up labor, and this implies that equal investments of capital will yield different rates of profit depending on whether more or less is put into wages, living labor on the one hand, or material accessories, stored up labor on the other. But this theory contradicts the obvious fact that under capitalism, equal investments, regardless of their composition, tend to yield equal profits. In the first two volumes, Marx ignores differences in the composition of different capitals. In effect, he assumes that such differences do not exist, but in volume three, he drops this assumption. And recognizing the tendency to general equality in the rates of profit inquires how the resulting, quote, prices of production, end quote, are related to the values of volume one. Marx works this relation out by starting from a value scheme in which the composition of capitals varies with a consequent multiplicity of profit rates. He now takes the average of these profit rates and calculates prices of production by the following formula. constant capital plus variable capital plus the uh, what the fuck I'm trying to sorry I'm trying to read this equation he has here he has constant cap the way it reads is constant capital plus variable capital plus cost price which is constant capital and variable capital times the profit rate equals the price of production. Yeah, okay. Where constant capital represents the investment in plant and materials, 
variable capital, the investment in wages, and P, the average rate of profit. Now there is undoubtedly a flaw in this method. The two items, constant capital and variable capital, are taken over from the value scheme and remain unchanged in the price of production scheme. In other words, input is measured in values while output is measured in prices of production. Obviously this is not right. A large part of today's output becomes tomorrow's input and it is clear that to be consistent they must be measured in the same terms. Marx himself was aware of the difficulty and it is not unlikely that he would have dealt with it if he had lived to complete the third volume, but as it stands the treatment of the relation between the values and prices of production is not logically satisfactory. Bumbavrk's Bumbavrk obviously did not see this problem at all. It is true that he regarded the whole operation of transforming values into prices of production as pointless, but a skilled debater does not ignore a detected weakness in his opponent's argument simply because he considers the argument to be futile. Hilferding, on the other hand, seems never to have questioned the soundness of Marx's procedure. Indeed, this is not surprising. Earlier Marxist writers had taken it for granted, and, and no hostile critic had called it into question. It was left for Bortkiewicz, Bortkiewicz in the paper included as an appendix to this volume. I actually have the German to English uh, translator up, and let's see what it, how it pronounces the name. Ladislaus Botkiewicz. Botkiewicz. Bartkiewicz. It was left for Bartkiewicz in the paper included as an appendix to this volume to take up the problem and to attempt to solve it within the framework of the Marxian theory of value and surplus value. Ladislaus von Bortkiewicz. Bortkiewicz. Damn it, how is it said again? Bortkiewicz. Ladislaus Bortkiewicz. Kiewicz. Ladislaus von Bortkiewicz is known primarily as a statistician. In an obituary which appeared in the Economic Journal, Professor Schumpeter called him, quote, by far the most eminent German statistician since Lexis, end quote. And I think nothing has occurred in the meanwhile to make this judgment less valid today than it was in 1932, in the opinion of Oscar Anderson, himself a mathematical statistician of distinction, Bortkiewicz was, quote, one of the few really great men in the field of mathematical statistics, end quote. This high reputation as a statistician was not unnaturally, has not unnaturally tended to divert attention from Bortkiewicz's contributions to economics. And an additional reason for his relative obscurity as an economist lies in the fact that the most significant of these contributions took the form of critiques of the theories of others. But if it be granted that the function of criticism is important in its own right, then it can hardly be denied that Bortkiewicz deserves a place among the top flight economists of the early 20th century. It is not easy to classify Bortkiewicz's economics. Professor Schumpeter says that Bortkiewicz professed, quote, the Marshallian creed, end quote, but this probably refers to the later period of his life and to his teaching rather than to his writing. At any rate, there is little evidence of a Marshallian influence in his papers on Marx, and it is with these that we are primarily concerned. Judging them from these parts, it seems to me that Bortkiewicz must be described as a modern Ricardian, the powerful impress of Ricardo's thought is evident throughout, and Bortkiewicz was at great pains to defend Ricardo against what he considered to be unjustified criticism. A faithful Ricardian in Bortkiewicz's time could not have but have an ambivalent attitude toward both the important contemporary schools of economic thought. 
In fundamental social outlook and aims, he was in agreement with the subjective value school and opposed to the Marxian school. On the other hand, acceptance of the labor theory of value necessarily brought Borkiewicz into conflict with many of the most important doctrines of the subjective value theorists and gave him much in common with Marxian ideas. This peculiar mixture of sympathies and antipathies is together, altogether characteristic of Bortkiewicz's economic writings and goes far, I suspect, to explain their strikingly original and stimulating quality. Bortkiewicz's attitude towards Marx had four facets. Where Marx agreed with Ricardo, Bortkiewicz tended to approve. Where Marx disagreed with Ricardo, Bortkiewicz tended to defend Ricardo. Where Marx departed altogether from Ricardo in the whole theory of capitalist development, Bortkiewicz was either uninterested or uncomprehending. And finally, where Marx pushed forward trails which Ricardo had blazed, Bortkiewicz was a sympathetic and constructive critic. It is in this last connection that Bortkiewicz took up the problem of value and price in the Marxian system. The Ricardian system involves a highly original and at the same time, paradoxical line of reasoning. Starting from the labor theory of value, Ricardo stumbled upon the theory that profit is a deduction from the product of labor. But e given the existence of profit, and assuming capitals of different durability or turnover time, Ricardo proceeded at once to demonstrate that the result is exchange ratios, prices, which no longer conform to the requirements of the labor theory of value. In other words, the labor theory of value forms the starting point for a chain of reasoning which leads to conclusions at variance with the labor theory of value. Now the question at once arises, is this a legitimate procedure? Does it lead to valid results or is it self-defeating? Ricardo never attempted to answer these questions. He was content to take the validity of his results for granted. For a strict logician like Bortkiewicz, this must have been a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. He was convinced of the correctness of Ricardo's theory of profit, which he called the, quote, deduction theory, end quote. But he could not help recognizing that the reasoning which supported it was incomplete and unsatisfactory. There was no rational explanation in the Ricardian system of the relation of, quote, values to, quote, prices, or of the whole of profit in mediating between them. Under these circumstances, it is quite understandable that Marx's explicit posing of this problem and attempt to solve it in Volume 3 of Capital claimed Bortkiewicz's careful attention and even seemed to him to be Marx's outstanding contribution to economic theory. Bortkiewicz wrote two papers on Marxian economics, Wert, Rechnung und Preis, Rechnung, and the article which is printed below on the correction of Marx's fundamental theoretical construction in the third volume of Capital. It is obvious from the titles that both are centered around the problem of revalue of the relation between values and prices, and it is also clear from the respective publication dates that they were, so to speak, joint products of a period of intensive study of Marx and his critics. The fact that they were published separately and in different journals, however, shows that Bortkiewicz's, Bert, Bortkiewicz's <laughs> the fact that they were published separately and in different journals, however, shows that Bortkiewicz regarded them as independent works, each of which could stand on its own feet. Werthrechnung und Preisrechnung is much the more ambitious and general of the two. It includes an elaborate examination of earlier criticisms of Marx, from which incidentally the critics, including Bumbavark, emerge with little glory. A discussion of the flaw in Marx's method of transforming values into prices of production, and a reconsideration of this problem in terms of an equational system attributed by Bortkiewicz to the Russian economist W.K. Dmitriev which conforms to Ricardian theory more closely than to Marxian theory. It does not, however, attempt to solve... One second.
It does not, however, attempt to solve the transformation problem as Marx himself presented it. It was to this task that the article included in the present volume was specifically directed. It is not my purpose in this introduction to analyze the method which Bortkiewicz, Bortkiewicz substitutes for Marx's, whatever may be thought of it today and of the corollaries which Bortkiewicz drew from it. There can be no question that it was the first attempt to solve the problem and thus forms the actual starting point for all subsequent work on the subject. Moreover, and this is something which many Marxists tend to overlook, the aim of the article, and in my judgment its effect as well, was not to attack Marxian theory but to vindicate Marxian theory. Most previous, and for that matter, subsequent critics considered the theory of value and surplus value to be the Achilles heel of the Marxian system. Bort Bortkiewicz almost alone regarded it as Marx's most important contribution. By eliminating relatively superficial errors, he hoped to be able to show that the core of the system was sound. No serious student of classical Marxian political economy can, I submit, afford to neglect Bortkiewicz's reasoning. I do not want to be interpreted as making extravagant claims for Bortkiewicz. When I undertook to write a general introduction to Marxian economics, I found Bortkiewicz's treatment of the transformation problem to be the most complete and satisfactory available. In order to show that the error in Marx's method is without importance for the theoretical system as a whole, I reproduced in summary form Bortkiewicz's solution to the, uh, of the problem. For the rest, I discussed the significance of the problem rather than the method of solving it. My discussion fortunately called the problem to the attention of others better equipped than I to deal with its mathematical aspects. Their work, some of which has been published, which more I hope to follow, has convinced me that Bortkiewicz's method of transforming values into prices, while unobjectionable as far as it goes, is mathematically clumsy and is based on unnecessarily restrictive assumptions. I also suspect most of the Bortkiewicz's I suspect, I suspect that most of Bortkiewicz's corollaries are connected in one way or another with assumptions of this kind, or as Kenneth May suggests, flow from a confusion on Bortkiewicz's part between the failure of certain relations to appear in his mathematical formulas and their absence from the real phenomenon which the formulas only partially reflect. It is to be hoped that the discussion which has now been begun will lead to a more or less definitive solution of the transformation problem and its implications. If the publication in English and in readily available form of Bortkiewicz's original essay on the subject contributes to that end, I shall regard it as fully justified. As editor of these works, I have in general confined my efforts to making them more readable and more usable to present-day teachers and students of the social sciences. Style and spelling have been rendered uniform throughout, all quotations from Capital, the book, now refer to the care, the care edition, though the wording, except in the case of Hilferding's quotations from Volume 3, remains that of the translators of these works. The translations themselves have been altered in a few places which were unclear or ambiguous or dated by checking back to the German originals. For example, Miss MacDonald's translation of Arbeitskraft as, quote, working papers, end quote, has everywhere been replaced by the more familiar, excuse me, why did I say papers? For example, Miss MacDonald's translation of Arbeitskraft as, quote, working powers, end quote, has everywhere been replaced by the more familiar, quote, labor power, end quote. All references in Hilferding to Bumbarvik, Bumbarvik have been given the page numbers of the present volume, Several of Eden and Cedar Paul's translators' notes to Hilferding's remain and are identified by their initials. See especially the long note on page 143 to 144 where the Pauls enter into a debate with Hilferding. In my judgment, Hilferding is perfectly correct in his interpretation of Marx at this point, but he did overlook a change in wording between the second and third editions which would have been taken which should have been taken into account. Paul M. Sweezy. April 10th, 1949, Wilton, New Hampshire.